So, and how would the audience react? To, they, they, they don't know. Some of them think it's great. Some people thought that it was weird to, to, to pull something like that. You know, yeah. The band is into it. The band would, you know, they would step off stage and stuff. Sometimes they would stand behind me and laugh. They were like, I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Big band licks. You know, I would set it up with like a, a, a rock and roll thing and then go into some fusion stuff and then go into some African stuff and then go into some big band, go into hip hop, go into go go. Yeah, really? So, I mean, you know, hip the people to it, man. Let them know that it's, you know, it's not. You know, I, I've never approached this music or this band with a rock and roll approach. I've never sat behind the kit. Not once, not one night, not one rehearsal and approached this. Approached Living Color as a rock and roll drummer. And what, how, what, 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 no, okay, can you define what you, your, how, how would, uh, your concept of that, what, how do you well, think of my concept of that is, um, there's, there's like a cliche rock style. That, that that to me, if that's what you're playing, that's cool. But I have too many things rolling around inside of me to approach Living Color as a cliche rock band. If, if you were going to write out the cliche rock, what would it be? Uh, well, you know, th th there are some patterns, there are some rock beats and patterns that I feel, I hear in a lot of bands now that I tell myself, come on, you know, there's definitely more happening there than that. Mm-hmm. And if that's what the music is for that particular drummer in that band, then fine. But I never... See, that's the thing about music. Like, Horace used to ask me, what kind of music do you want to play? And I could never answer him. I would always say, Horace, I don't know. Well, well, what kind of drummer do you want to sort of become? And I would always say, Horace, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he was testing me. I, I never asked him why he would ask me. I should do that. Yeah. But once, every couple of months, he would say, well, what, what do you want to do? What kind of style of music? And I said, I want to play music. Mm -hmm. you know, I want to learn as much as I can about the drums, about music, and I want to play music. And that might mean, you know, playing with Phyllis Hyman or, you know, playing with Living Color. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but I want to play music, and I want to feel satisfied when I play music. I don't want to feel like I'm restricted or regimented or I have to do this, or I have, you know. Certain music re requires a certain style, of course. If I'm if I'm on, when I was playing with Harry Belafonte and I was on Harry Belafonte's gig, I could not turn the beat around and crash on fire. Yeah. Because I I get my plane ticket home. <laughs> you know. You could do it, but you can only do it once. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I I couldn't do it because Harry had his groove that he wanted to hear and dance to, and you couldn't deviate. Yes, yeah, so it's and, and just just to approach the band, you know, I don't want to sit down and think every song has to be hard yeah every 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 double time section needs double bass every ride pattern section is quarter notes on the ride and, and you know two and four on a snare and you know one and three on a kick mm -hmm. I don't want to ever approach this band like that I feel like Vernon and Corey are very special artists at what they do and it requires something interesting not to put down anybody else I don't want this to sound like we're better than anyone else. It's just different. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very different. And I never, ever sat down. Like, you know, when sometimes it's a slap in the face when, somebody, when someone says, you know, you guys are playing rock. Sometimes we go, yeah, so what? And you don't think about it. Yeah. You know, you're playing music. You don't really think about it as, you know, and then someone will say, well, what do you think of Led Zeppelin? And they will say, well, they're great. And, you know, well, what do you think of Anthrax from Metallica? Well, they're great. And it's like, they want to hear something like, we're not like them. We're, you know what I mean? We're, we're like a soul rock band. <laughs> soul rock. I mean, that's what they want to hear. And yeah. Some writers that used to write on this band, you know, there was this one writer who wrote, the record is better when it's funky. Hmm. And the record is easier for him to deal with when it's, when it's funky. Because yeah. Because we're black. Yeah. But cult the personality and death of people bother him a little bit because it's a little harder. Yeah. It's a harder edge. And for him, he can associate blacks in that music. So... You know, for him, it's, it's it's easier for him when it's funky, and that's what I mean. Yeah. You know. Well, the album is, is uh, it was fun listening to it because what I did first before I listened to the album, I pulled out uh, Ronald Shannon Jackson's album Man Dance, and just on a hunch, I wanted to see. I said, let me re-listen to this and and uh, see if 
as much of an influence, you know, from that band. And there really wasn't. There were a couple of spots where I think on one one song, sort of, and I'm just trying to think, well, maybe Desperate People. I can't remember if uh, yeah, but at any rate, there was a little bit, you know, but uh, which is which is sort of natural. But there were a lot of different things in there, all the way to, I mean, the theme song is like straight out of you know, James Brown or something right, like that, right, you know. Right. And that was what, what was neat to me about the album. It was a real, if you were familiar with the history of rock and roll, for example, uh, right. you could hear a lot of it, a lot of different stuff in there. There was one time we even threw in the old album <laughs> in one of the songs. Yeah, well, it's, it's one of those things. Like, there's a CD floating around now. And I guess you can call up um, the management office if you want to get some of this, to get the primer and stuff, and have them send it to you. But there's a there's a CD floating around of a show we did at the Ritz when he first opened up. And um, this one radio guy saw me in Cincinnati or wherever we were, and he says, you know, I got that CD, you know, special edition CD that's only turned on to radio stations and stuff. And he says, I didn't make that gig at the Ritz, but you guys do did you know a theme song and then you did a thrash tune by the bad brains and you went into the ocean and it's all connected and this guy's like freaking out and i and i just told him man what does that tell you about music yeah you know sure it didn't take geniuses for us to sit down and do that we were having fun and we said hey let's do let's do the bad brains you know yeah let's do the thrash <laughs> tune. and then let's go in the theme song then we have some house samples ready to have some samples as well his pedals who wants some house music you played to that went back in the theme song and then we came out of the theme song rocking back into the hard rock thing and for us it's fun it's like yeah let's mm. do some James let's mm. do some Bad Brains let's yeah. do some Zeppelin you know for us it's, it's fun and people flipped out about that and one of the funniest things about that that was a live broadcast too yeah on the radio one of the funniest things about that when I listen to it this day is when the house thing comes in, Corey just says, don't touch that dial. That's right. You're still listening to the same station. Does he really? Yeah, he yeah. just says it right in the microphone. It's yeah. great. It's great in the middle of the show. Because, it, you know, we just sort of went through a little warp from scene to scene to scene. And um, we had fun doing it. And that's what I mean when I say, like, you know, I don't approach it as a, as a rock drummer. Mm -hmm. You know, to be called a rock drummer, to be called a rock band is one thing. But I'm just saying, personally, that's not my approach to this band. I'm trying to develop something different. And um, it's, you know, I'm feeling it's starting to work anyway. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about the recording the album, if we have time. Just a quick rundown for me the symbols you're using. Okay, I'm using a 20-inch uh, um, China Boy. Mm-hmm. Low. Um, I'm using a Mega Bell, 20-inch Mega Bell ride. Symbol on my left side. 19-inch uh, crash next to that, and then when you get to my right side, I'm using a power, power light ride Z symbol. Um, but beneath that is a 17-inch, usually medium fin, mm -hmm. medium um, symbol. And um, next to that is an 18-inch K crash ride, mm -hmm. and a piggyback on top. I have two, two sets of hi-hats, 13s on my right side, you know, ZK yep. combination. And on my right side, I use the bottom. Okay. The one symbol that you've had with you since you were two years old? You know, I used to really live and die by the ping ride. Did you? Yeah. yeah. I still have all my ping rides, even the ones I've cracked. I've kept them all because that was my, you couldn't tell me, like, that wasn't the happening ride. <laughs> uh, and um, I used it. You know, doing Park's apartment, and I used it all to, during Berkeley and stuff. And um, until they came up with this power um, Z ride, um, right around the time I, I um, went up to Boston, and uh, they mailed me a letter. And, um, you know, I was now in Dorsey, which was great. And, um, they said we have this new symbol, we want you. And I heard it and lost my mind. And now, you know, um, I feel like that symbol is part of my personality. It's, it's <laughs> all over the record. You know what I mean? <laughs> You've been on the road too long. I and the symbol are one, you know. <laughs> and that, that symbol, I live and die by that symbol now. Is know? it in the hotel room with you? No, but uh, I have a backup. I went up to the studio when I was in Boston and I said, can I? And I brought my old one and tried to get it an even match and I found an even match and I said, this is going to go out with me. Yeah. Just in case. I mean, I'm, I'm really particular about that. When we played the International Rock Awards, 
I didn't use my regular cymbal setup. And the guys at the Ocean were freaking out. They said, we, you know, we had this earth ride on stage. Where did you get that thing from? Yeah. And I said, man, they came to my house the day before the show and told me, we need to pick up your equipment. There's 12 to 15 different setups backstage, and we need to get your stuff up today. Wow. And I said, okay, hold on a second. And I gave them my other set of cymbals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because when he said there were at least 10 different drum kits backstage, I said, nah, -uh, there'll be no mixing and matching with my stuff. Yeah. So I gave them the stuff that I play on at home when my stuff's out. You know, and the guys freaked out about it. They want, you know, that's in Union Hall. I know you know what's happening. With this. Oh, God. They carry a symbol. Yep. You carry a case. So I gave them that stuff, you know. I didn't use it on the International Rock Awards, but, you know, I, I felt, you know. We Life goes there. on, right, you know? Yeah, well, Steve Jordan, the kids back there, and all these different guys have their drum kits back there. And I don't know whose symbols are going to go on what stand, what stuff's going to be pushed around, and. And I had a feeling if it, something funky did happen, who was I going to see? Yeah. Who was I going to tell? Excuse me, um, this guy came by to get my stuff today, and the, the same guy just probably picks it up and drops it off and doesn't really set him up. So it didn't sound too organized, basically. Yeah. And that's why I give a different set of symbols. Because whatever happened to the days when, I don't need my own set, you know, just let me bring my sticks and, you know, the one drum set will do the whole show. That be... Right. God. Right. Anyway, well, let's talk about the record now. Working with Jagger, the whole the whole thing, the whole thing about doing the record. How was that? Uh, uh, highlights and so forth. Um, basically, that came about. Um, Jagger came down to see us at CBGB's with Jeff Beck. With Jeff Beck? Yeah. No kidding. That must have been uh, neat. They were, well, I didn't know about it until the next day. I picked up Vernon to go to rehearsal, and Vernon said, Jeff Beck really likes your drumming. Wow. I said, what are you talking about? Did someone mail him a tape or something? And he says, no, he, was, he came to the show last night. I said, you got to be bullshit. You got to be shitting me. What, what the hell is going on? And he said, yeah, him and Jagger. I had no idea. They were there. You Good know, thing. I, I just played. Because I'm a big-time Jeff Beck fan. Mm -hmm. Big time. And he uses, like, the greatest drum, you know? Yeah. So that's how that started. And he saw us a week later and said, are you guys signed yet? And we said no. And he said, well, I want to get a tape of the show I saw. We gave him a tape. He got back to us and said, I want to produce two songs, Glam Boys in America, mm -hmm. you guys for a demo. And I'm up in Studio A and B in Sky, in, not Skyline, excuse me. And, um, Power Station? Right track. Okay. He was mixing in right track, mm -hmm. and he said, "I'm on 48th Street," and he said, "I want you guys to come up and do this." So we said, "Fine, let's do it." And you know, we went up there and did it. Working with Jack, it was great because he didn't come into the studio with that. Okay, I'm Mick Jagger. What I say goes. I will. I don't like this. I don't like that. I mean, you can disagree with him, mm -hmm. and it wasn't a problem. Okay. That was great, and he knows a lot about drums and drum sound. Stuff. Yeah, Charlie. Charlie has Watts has said that before. He's Charlie Watts said one time. He said, "I'm not a loud drummer," which he isn't. He said, "But uh, Mick knows how to how to record it so that on the records I sound like I'm playing." Uh, yeah, he's 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 really tuned in. I mean, he talked about my snare and mm -hmm. he tried different snares and I wound up using. It's weird. I, I used a chrome drum on Glamour Boys, which is a warmer song to me. And I used a wooden snare, the, the warmer sound on America. Yeah, I'm very particular about that. I went in and I used, you know, I used the kit that I that I play on live and record with. And um, Jagger was very cool to work with, very easy guy to work with. And eventually we got signed. I don't want people to think Jagger produced our demo and people were standing in line waiting for us to come out of the studio with a hot tape. Yeah. It still took a while. When it finally happened, um, the contact this company again. It didn't happen, so I left it alone. I said, well, I'm going to use these are the drums I had. You know, I brought them myself. Mm -hmm. Worked in high school, bought the kit, played them in Berkeley all these years. I'm going to use it. I thought the kit sounded amazing, and I think they came out great on the album. So the drum sound is wonderful on the yeah. album. Well, that was done in Skyline. If I can get a room like that in my place, I don't think I would ever come outside. <laughs> <laughs> the room is amazing. That room is just, I mean, before you even put any mics up in there, I was in there just warming up, and I played, I played almost an hour and a half. Well, that's right. You must have flipped because you've got the background in that recording and engineering, too, yeah, right? Yeah, it was yeah. great to 
have that background and talk to, especially Ed Stasium. A lot of people don't like to talk about Ed because he's not really known to some people. Yeah. But Ed was the cat that really did a lot of work. Ed spent two weeks in pre-production with us, chopping up songs, trying different things, working on different things. You know, I played to a click on that album, and he wanted me to do all the songs to a click, and you know, that's where we, we rehearsed it. And um, was that your first uh, time working with a click? For a whole album, yeah. yeah. I, I'm doing, you know, I've done sessions where it was like a song or two, but it's it's cool. I learned a lot about playing with the click. Things Kenwood taught me, and um, basically I try to get like a hi hat tambourine sound mm -hmm. and um, lock into it so you don't hear it. When you when you smash that snare, you can't hear the, the percussion. That means you're right on time. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you when you hear it early and you hear it late, that means you're off time. So for me, it took about four or five minutes to warm up to. And then the rest of the album was no problem. I didn't even think about the click. Yeah. I didn't even really think about it. The only song we couldn't use a click on was Funny Vibe. We tried. Ed tried to set up two different time signatures and then punch one in. <laughs> you know, he didn't tried, work. but it didn't work. Yeah. The song is just too loose. Yeah. It's too many changes and it's too loose. Yeah. So that was the only song we didn't use a click on. But Ed was great. Very easy guy to work with. He really, really worked hard with us. He really, really listened to me when I talked about things we, we tried like three different mics on the kick drum one close one in the middle one far away built a little tunnel you know outside of my kick drum we tried all kinds of things i've also learned a lot from ed hanging mics room mics mm -hmm. snare mics top and bottom i i took pictures of that session Did you? yeah <laughs> i took pictures of every microphone in that room the way where it was what angle in relation to my drum kit inside the kick drum i mean i got in a little tunnel we built and put a, um, a light in there and took photos and stuff. Yeah, I have all that stuff at home. So is it, I always wondered about that because, I mean, the, I tell you, the first the first drummer I thought of uh, when I when I heard your sound was Bonham. Uh, and not that you were playing like him, but the resonance of the drums was, was uh, reminiscent of the sound that Bonham used to get on records, and it sounded great. So I figured, putting two and two together, that there must have been some mics pretty far back. It's weird. A lot of people ask me about about John Bonham. I've always loved the band. Mm -hmm. I've always loved his playing. I love the way, especially when he plays behind the beat. It always sounds like it's like good simple. I like things like that. Yeah. And he was like, to me, on the rock scene at that time, probably one of the masters of that. Mm -hmm. Just playing uh, immediately behind the beat and doing a fill and coming right back in or playing in time and doing a fill behind the beat mm -hmm. and um you know to me he just he, he he had that feel he had that really really powerful feel but he had that feel to just move around within the beat which is great mm -hmm. you know what i mean just to to sit on it or to to push it or to just sit behind it and i think that more so than sound that was the thing about john bonham i loved the most i did dig his drum sound a lot of people approach me about john bonham and they say well that you remind me of John Bonham and stuff. And I said, well, you know, what do you mean? They talk about, well, your drum sound is big. And I said, well, I thought having a big drum sound was crucial because back when you, you listen to Blakey and those cats, mm -hmm. those cats had big drum sounds. Yep. They were playing in band and the recording situations are nothing like they are now. Well, they were so playing. That was my first influence on big sounds like Max's sound, yeah. Papa Joe's, the real big kick drums. And they didn't have big drums, but they had a big sound. Mm -hmm. Elvin has a big sound. Mm -hmm. And that was my first love with big sounds. But the thing I will say about Bonham, more so than his sound, that really turned me on was his style. His style was incredible. Mm hmm. Well, I think people nowadays are used to hearing, uh, and it sounds like your drums were pretty open. Oh, yeah. I don't. I, that's why Ed and I shook hands right away. He yeah. was the first producer to say, don't do anything to your set. You know, because I don't like tape. Yeah. I don't like muffs. Are they wide open for you? Were your drums wide open for you? Totally wide open on that album. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you can get, if you can, if you really know how to tune a drum, top and bottom head, you can get a good sound. And you, you can get some of those frequencies that ring to cancel each other. You can get a good sound on your kit without what? necessarily using using dampeners and stuff. Now, I'm not saying not to use them because there's some times when you have a new head on it and it just doesn't, you know, you can fight it and it won't happen. Mm -hmm. So I do carry them and use them from time to time. And there are times also when you play certain stages and 
the floor times ring from the kick drum or the stage could be hollow and weird things happen to your kit or there's a brick wall in the back behind the curtain that you that you can't tell mm-hmm. or there's like cement somewhere and you're like why does my snare drum ring like that so there are certain times when you have to you know compensate but on that album man there's no tape my snare's open my tom's open my kick drum's open what, what, what head combinations are you using I have almost all of my snare heads from that session because I changed them every two takes or something two or three takes so I just kept them for like souvenir kind of thing. And I really used to live and die by the clear emperor on my snare. Clear ambassadors on the bottom. Pinch stripes on top. Clear ambassadors on the bottom. On my toms. Mm -hmm. And now I just made a change uh, where I'm using the Remo Falam's head. Hmm. They're, to me, the first head to come out that sort of has this sort of substitute material thing to it. Yeah. That doesn't sound you know, wimpy or cracky or or too materialistic. It doesn't sound like a made in cardboard or foam or leather or <laughs> whatever it is these different manufacturers use. Yeah. But this sounds like a drum head. It cracks, it doesn't break. The last tour I did is when I that that's when I sort of discovered this head. Um you know, I changed three heads the whole tour. In Europe. I changed I changed my head three times and I didn't have to do that. I just did it because I said, oh, okay, you know, it's, it's marking up. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. But basically, um, it's a great head. I recommend it to all my friends who are hard hitters, who are heavy drummers and who tour. Mm-hmm. Because it sounds really, really good. It does. It sounds great. Like, you know, there are some other brands I'm sure you are hip to that I've tried that the drum just doesn't sound good with that head on it. Yeah. Yeah. The Evans. Yeah, I hate Blue line. There's a few. That yeah, like, nah, this is not the move. Yeah, but um, I, re- I recommend you, <laughs> I recommend you um, trying it out. The Falams, you know, I just ran across it in a studio somewhere where I played it, and I was like, "What is this?" Because the head was fading away, and I couldn't read it. Huh? And the guy said, "Oh, these are new emo uh, Falam heads, man. They they they're great. They don't break, man. You know, we've had Steve Jordan in here and so and so here. They're great." And I called him up right away, and I said, "Send twenty. Send twenty. Yes, yeah, send a dozen. What were you using? What were you using on your bass drum uh, heads? When uh, you record, when you were, pinch stripes. That's when you when recorded. Drum, when I recorded. Yeah. Okay. Um, front, uh, front and back. Front head, back head. I, I still have that black ebony, because it, it dries the sound up. You don't have to use uh, like a whole lot of pillows and stuff, blankets and stuff. So I use the black ebony series on the back and um, I used to finish on the front. Okay. I went through a period of, of um, ambassadors, I mean emperors, excuse me, on my times as well. But I, I went back to finish stripes. Boy, yeah, we, we've got to cover some ground here. I, yeah, I have to ask you this because I, I, I don't want to hang up the phone and forget this about uh, the little snippet of Skin Deep on the record. Skin Deep. You know the song? Yeah. I just get it, it, it shows up on the record. Oh yeah, okay. I was just gonna ask you, who was that your decision to do that? Um, that sampling thing is, yeah. I mean, you know, there's a a lot of people ask us about about this band, right? Yeah. And the seriousness of it, and the meaning and stuff. And that stuff is really, we. I mean, we're very serious about funny vibes, and you know, which way to America. We're very serious about that. Yeah. But this, you know, we we like to have fun. We're definitely outgoing. We're all four outgoing guys. Yeah. And all of that thing. The whole the whole thing with samples, horn hits and that stuff, it, it's all a part of us having fun and putting in something in there that people wouldn't recognize right away. Why Skin Deep? I mean, was that something that you picked because you liked that tune or? Which which section are you talking about? I've got the album here in front of me. There's one song, I'm, I'm sorry I can't remember the name of it, there's, there's like an announcer's voice that comes in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's speaking over, there's like a drum roll. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, that's uh, broken heart, yeah. Okay, all right, now that music is Duke Ellington. Right, uh, Skin right. Deep with and, Louis, Louis Belson's and, cut. Right, and the horn hits are from um, Ellington's band as well. Yeah. Right. So I was, when I heard that, I said, oh, man, you know, and I just was wondering if that was uh, uh, a track maybe that had... Uh, you know, you liked particularly like that well, track? Or? I did. I did like the track. Vernon, Vernon liked the intro. Okay. I mean, I like the song. Vernon liked the whole big intro thing. Um, Fanfare. Yeah, yeah. Vernon thought. Well, you know, that was an accident. That song was going to just start out with drums, and Jagger's harmonica was an accident. That was just going to be a drum thing. Okay. Um, 
that was Dennis's old roadie, by the way, that's speaking on that record. Okay. And we figured it was a hoax. We played the sample. He was in the studio. That's that's what we do, man. We fool around. We joke around all the time. It was one of those things that was a great idea, and we did it. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of what happened. The same thing with having that train at yeah, the yeah, subway. Airport. We used to rehearse in the studio yeah. um, on Decal and Broadway in Brooklyn. And, it, and it, the uh, train tracks, you know, we're on the second floor, and the train tracks are almost parallel with the rehearsal loft. And almost every time we play that song, a train went by. <laughs> song. Now, the, when, when Ed came in to do production, we were trying it for the last time when we were going to go into the studio, you know, and start on the album. Yeah. And right when the song ended, a train went by. So it was on his tape. Now, of course, we didn't think about it because trains go by while we rehearse all the time. We got in the studio, we laid the tracks, and Ed was scratching his head like, damn, something is missing. Something is missing. I can't. And he couldn't figure it out. Oh, until, no kidding. Yeah, he couldn't figure it out until he played. He went home and played the tape again, and it was the train. So he had his assistant go out and, and go into Times Square. And, <laughs> and that was another accident. Yeah. That's what I mean when I say that. These are the things that just sort of happened. And it's funny how Vivid came together, and it's funny how the album was so successful. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the things that we did, we, we, we tried and just sort of, you know, Jagger was on, was in England doing something, and he stopped in to see how the album was going and had his harmonica with them. Uh -huh. And we said, why don't you try to blow something over this Broken Hearts track? And he was like, nah, 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 come on, try to blow a little something, yeah, we want to have you. You know, and he thought it was a hip concept and it sounded great. Yeah. And then that, the harmonica thing was used. So I was at overdub sessions every day. I tried to, you know, I tried to go as many days as possible. Basically, um, I laid out a couple of days after I laid my drum tracks just to rest. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I was down there every day. And if you weren't there every day, you would not have, you know, witnessed how this album was put together. Mm hmm because you know, Muzz went out on vacation for a little while and he came back and was like, what happened to Broken Hearts? What the hell is this thing? What's this harmonica shit? What, you know? <laughs> he came back and freaked out. <laughs> you know, So if you weren't there to, like, to, to be a part of that magic, I mean, you, you would have never guessed how these, I mean, none of this stuff was planned. When I heard the album, I don't know, maybe from growing up in New York, uh, I picked up one and it wouldn't catch me uh, off guard. Is the attitude that, that comes through from from the lyrics a lot of times is it's not it, it, it's it's like um, when you see a movie where some guy's screwing up and his friend grabs him and gives him just like a, a sort of a sharp slap across the face right. you know and just like come on come on you know right. and that's that was sort of the uh, the the impact the album had on me that that here were four guys they were all good players they were they were writing about topics that meant something to them, but they still, it wasn't like, a, uh, well, that's it, you know, the world's going to blow up and things are shitty, and there was still hope <laughs> in the lyrics, and it was like that slap in the face where, hey, come on, you know, get your get your act together, right. and uh, so that that's kind of how the uh, how your music strikes me. That's a clear, uh, well, I'm glad it had that kind of effect on you, because um, some people think we're too serious, and uh, we are very serious, but, we, you know... We do like to have fun, and we, and, and we do, you know, relate to these issues in a serious way. But this, that's not, I mean, I Want to Know is a love song, you know? It's yeah. a song about, can you please give me a sign? And, and, you know, do you feel the same way that I do about you? I mean, you know, it's a love song. Broken Hearts is a love song. It's about breaking up with somebody, you know? And Cult of Personality deals with the whole concept of people giving up their rights and their, their, their personal beliefs to follow in a leader who, who they feel going to lead them to whatever, whatever, yeah. over the rainbow, you know what I mean? Yeah. And these are the things that, that we just sort of talk about. And it's, it's not it's not a serious thing about, you know, we're black, we're fighting, it's rock and roll thing, we're fighting America, and white people are like, I mean, it's not, that's not the hang-up mm -hmm. of this record. And mm -hmm. see, that's a, the other side about, just that frustrates me, sometimes when you speak out about something, people take it as you being militant. Yeah. It's like, some people approach us like, well, how can you guys be pissed? You know, you guys are, are really successful and you won all these awards. And, you know, and I, I have to sit down and tell them stories about Vernon catching the cab. Yeah. And me still walking down the street and the old lady clutching her bag, you know. Yeah. I mean, that, that that's the reality of it. That's the reality. Or, or, or me going into a neighborhood and being chased out. Yeah. 
and you know maybe five of those kids that chased me have the record. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but but that that's the reality of it. That's the ignorance of it. Yeah. And um, that's the other side of it that we like to let people you know know yeah. as well. Did you ever hear Alex Haley tell the story about the time he almost got mugged by a couple of black guys? No. It's, it was uh, a thing. It was on TV. I think it was in the yeah. It was in a TV show, talk show. What you just said reminded me of that because he was saying, you know, here I was, Alex Haley. You know, Roots had just come out on television, right? I don't even know where, I remember where he was, but I guess he was in a section of some town somewhere that was not too not too good. And he got to pull up to a 7-Eleven or something like that, you know, to get a cup of coffee, whatever. And these guys came over to him and uh, started hassling him. And he said, he, he was thinking in his mind, he said, God, how ironic. You know, here I am. I'm Alex Haley. Right? That's right. I wrote Roots, you know. <laughs> Why are these guys hassling me? So, but it worked out all right for him, I guess, you know. But, uh, yeah, is that, you know, that's the reality. That you're a victim. You know, those things happen. And it's not a black or white issue. It's just about the reality of it. People try to turn it into a black and white issue all the time. There are shitheads all the time. You know, I think especially yeah. if you're from New York, you know that. That's right. There's shitheads <laughs> in every race, man. There's shitheads in every race. It's not, you know, this person is going to do this with this person. Like, all Italian people are not in the mafia. You know what I mean? Right. There's, there's, there's that side of it. You know what I mean? You know, all Irish men in their 50s are not police chiefs. <laughs> you know, and people have these, these, these premonitions about this kind of thing. Yeah. It sucks, but... That's that's kind of how that was put together, the Duke Ellington thing put together. Also, I think we were going through a massive CD craze around that time. Yeah. Everything that we heard of, we tried to buy on CD during that time. Huh. And um, that Duke Ellington record folded across the desk, as well as a lot of Zeppelin. Um, during that time, I wasn't a CD fan. I am now. But I wasn't then. Aren't you glad you didn't grow up? Uh, you remember spending your money on records. Aren't you glad you didn't have to buy CDs? Forget about it. Jesus. I, I, would, I would have like half the collection that I have. Yeah, yeah. You know, forget about it. But I think that was the big thing. We, we were just going out every day and buying everyone in the band, the, the assistants. Everyone was just, because our sessions were really cool. Mm -hmm. They were closed and they were cool. Everybody was cool. It was like family. It made it easier for us to work. Somebody said, yo, here's a, here's a new David Lee Roth. Uh, I bought Stack's Greatest Hits. Corey went out and got some. You know, is that a new one, Stack's Greatest Hits? Yeah, that, no that, kidding. that came out around the time we started working on, on our album. It's a great CD. I bet. It's a great CD. So yeah. that's where some of the other horn stuff came from as well. Okay. The Stack CD. And, um, Al Jackson and... Uh, yeah, yeah. And great, who's here again? Great music. Um, oh, God, I keep forgetting this guy. I must have met the history of rock drum. Roger... Uh, I thought you had that. Did you have that in your article? No, I, I apologize. Cause what was his name? See, I'm forgetting again. The guy did, he did the Aretha sessions, like Respect and... Uh... That's, I think that's because there was a photo in there. When Al Jackson had an had a, um, interview in there, or, or someone did an interview, a write-up on him. Yeah, T. Bruce Whitted did a, did yeah, a piece yeah. on him. Yeah. Did a write-up on him. They had some photos of some of those gigs. Man, that was amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, But there was a guy, God, I'm, I'm Roger... Uh, I don't know his last name. Bad. I mean, he's done. He's like you know, he's done as many records as as a Steve Gadd or something like right. that. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, people on here, but <sighs> Roger. Jeez, I'm getting too much tuna fish. The mercury is <laughs> lodging in my brain. You know. Anyway, well, I'm getting. How about clinics? You got any uh, any thought about doing clinics? Yes, I'd love to do them. Okay. Uh, when I get time. Uh, I've been talking to a few, a few people about them. I feel I feel weird about like I can totally do it and be relaxed. I don't think I'll be uncomfortable. So I want to just make sure the presentation is right mm -hmm. um, to people and they can understand because I, I I think I have a different approach than some people do just about playing, mm -hmm. just about music. And I don't want to get out there and sound vague and have some kids go, "What the hell is he talking about?" Mm -hmm. You know, so. I love to do some. I also have a concept that I want to do for clinics where I, I want to, you know, I had a band in Berkeley, mm -hmm. you know, called Dark Sarcasm. That was the name of my band. And um, that's how I got interested in recording an engineer because I did a lot of songwriting and I recorded as many tunes as possible and mixed them myself and established something for myself in Berkeley. And that band I think was probably my highest high musically because I was developing and I was writing and I was recording all at the same time you know I mean and wow. I was in school and I you know I just it kept me I, I wasn't 
hanging out and, and doing a whole bunch of dating and stuff during that time because I was just, you know, immersed. My, I just immersed myself in all that. Mm -hmm. Like, here I'm in school, I'm writing, I'm hanging out, I'm, you know. I didn't even think about eating. I just ate when I was hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, it wasn't like it's 5 o'clock, it's time to eat. It's like, you know, I've been in the studio 10 hours to out, get something to eat, order something. I would like to get two of the guys um, that, I, that worked with me during that time, the bass player and guitar player, and actually play some songs and play some material mm -hmm. from the, the time, you know, from some of the songs that we wrote and definitely some newer stuff, to talk about playing, to talk, instead of just playing by myself, to talk about playing, to, 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 to see what it's like to play behind the beat, to turn the beat around, to feel the one, and the applied one, and um, solos of a form. I would even like to have a singer maybe even come in and sit in to talk about playing behind soloists. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a nice idea. It's, it's, a different, it's a different approach that a lot of drummers don't deal with sometimes. I mean, a lot of cats know about this stuff, but no one's talking about it. I know. And it's a, it's a thing, you know, it's, it's different, man. You back somebody up, it's different. It's just different when you, you know, when you're playing behind an alto player, you're playing behind a piano, so it's just a small trio. And I like to talk. I mean, I want to definitely talk about William Calhoun and do my own thing, but I would also like to touch on music. Mm-hmm. How about the, mu the music business? Would you talk about that? Well, I, want, I definitely want to talk about the music business. I want to talk about the perception of the music business. I want to talk about kids, you know, wh whether the kids are grown up or whatever. You know, take piano, take harmony. Don't just get caught up in being the cat. And, you know, my own personal opinion, don't get caught up in just being a session musician or just a side man. Yeah. You know, of course, if that's what you want to do, I don't want to change your direction. But realize that you can be in control of your own destiny by just simply grabbing hold and making it happen. And you don't have to wait for your phone to ring. That expression, to me, doesn't have to exist. You don't have to sit down and wait for your phone to ring. If you're in control of what you're doing, you know, yeah. you, you can make some calls and get your own work just by calling. Or someone can call you, and, you know, in response to you, taking hold, grabbing hold, and, and sort of setting your own direction. And that's what I'm trying to do myself. I mean, I love Living Color. I want to play with this band for as long as we can play together. But um, there's, there's a million other things I also want to get my hands into. I, you know, I want to do some straight ahead gigs. I want to get back, you know, to um, my band that I started because uh, right when we started to burst, I felt, you know, right right when we decided to explode, um, my keyboard player went out. The Withers, I went out. Belafonte, my bass player, went out and did some go-go stuff in D.C., Chuck Brown and stuff. And it separated us. Well, you know, we we got out of school and we got to make a living. Sure. But um, eventually I want to get back to to, um, to to that because that was some really special music. Those are really special friends of mine. And um, I think if we were to get together on this level, everyone's grown and is doing their own thing and doing it well. Mm -hmm. If we were to get back together on this level, it would only be that much better. So I would like to talk about the business of people. Anyone has any questions about business? Anyone has any questions about lawyers, attorneys? Whether you're broke or you're loaded, go talk to somebody about money. Yeah. Just do it. Pick up Money Magazine. Read it. You know what I mean? <laughs> do things like that because you never know. This business is cutthroat. It's overnight sensation. You could, you could, you know, you could be in a band one minute, and the next minute you could be on MTV or on the top of the charts or on this. You don't want to have your cash being handled by people who are just going to rip you off. Mm -hmm. So always allow yourself room and time, you know. Those kind of things I would like to talk to people about because... You do or you do not? I, yes, I do. Oh, okay. I do. I really would like to because I think those are the things that sort of scare people. I have a couple of friends that, that are jaded by the music business. They're burning musicians. They came to New York or went to L.A. or wherever, went to Europe, and they started making money, and people were hawking them and stuff, and they, they, they got nervous. Yeah. So they said, maybe I'll just be a side man. It's safe. Yeah. You know, maybe I'll just work in the studio. And, you know, it's like I told my friends, man, you have the talent to be a Stevie Wonder. You have the talent to be a Quincy Jones, man. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Don't just sit down and don't be afraid to get a lawyer or get an attorney. Don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to say yes. You know, those are the kind of things I like to talk about as well. Because I didn't, you know, I didn't make all the right, you know, choices sort of coming up and dealing with music. I feel like I've made most of them right. I look mm -hmm. back sometimes and I feel like 
you know, the reason why I said no here was because I said yes here. Maybe destiny was 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 set, and, and I was supposed to be here now. You know, I'd like to think that. That's yeah. great. But there were some things that floated by that I I often think about. You know, I had an opportunity to go to Japan three times when I was in Berkeley, huh. and I turned it down. And it was great money. And sometimes, you know, when I when I went to Japan two months ago with Living Color, I I thought about it. I'm like, wow, well, I wonder what would be what would happen to me. Where would I be now if I left school to come here? Mm-hmm. And it's something that happened. And it's just something that I decided not to do, you know. And these are the kind of things I like to bring to people's minds because they read stuff, they read about artists, and they or they look at MTV or they 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 assume. It's girls and money, drugs. I uh, know MTV is the, the uh, you, know, you know. I mean, I know they're great. They're great for putting things out there, but the image thing is. I mean, I mean, if you're going to put something out there, put it all out there. We we can't get in TV, so I only see it now and again, which I think is good. I don't like to watch it because, you know why? Because it it um, if I see a video, <laughs> excuse me, then whenever I listen to that, whenever I hear that song, I, I'm I'm envisioning the video, you know. So it like right. takes away. The imagination, right. you know, and so, uh, but man, I can't believe some of the crap that, that yeah, it's garbage. Yeah, it's garbage. And there are kids that are glued to MTV, and they think that's uh, like uh, Dire Straits, "Money for Nothing" and "Chicks yeah. for Free." That's that's the uh, the basic uh, concept of the of the music business. And the ironic thing about that video was, it was a big video. Yeah, <laughs> it, it played all the time. People called up for it and loved it. Yeah, that was the ironic thing about it. That's what happened with us. We called the personality. Yeah, <laughs> the very thing we wrote about, you know, sort of happened to this man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hung by the tongue. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like wow. You know, you got people screaming. You know, we used to go out and play, and some kids would just scream that the opening song. Go play called the personality, and it's like, look, pal. You know, there's, there's like 10 or 12 other songs you're going to hear tonight. Yeah. If you want to hear that, go to the bar, you know, have a couple of drinks and uh, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait your turn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, have you ever read any of uh, Napoleon Hill's uh, books? No. You know, no Napoleon Hill? No. Okay, you, you, might, you might get a kick out of them. Just, uh... Yeah, sure.